So welcome back. This is going to be our second screencast for Chapter 13. And in this screencast, we are going to focus on the life cycle of cnidarians. We're going to look at um, why these animals are considered diploblastic. We're also going to look at the feeding behavior and some of the feeding strategies and how they digest their food. Um, we're going to look at the um, nervous system of these animals. And we're also going to take a little bit more of a look at um, the cnidocytes that are used by these animals. Now, when you talk about cnidarian life cycles, typically you're talking about a two-stage type of life cycle. Now, when we say two stages, we're referring to um, when the polyp stage, in this case, is going to be used, and when the medusa stage is going to be used. So when you're talking about the polyp stage of a cnidarian, typically you're going to find that polyp involved in an asexual type of reproductive strategy. When you're talking about the medusa, normally you're going to talk about these um, particular body stages as being involved in a sexual type of reproductive strategy. Now, regardless of whether it's a polyp or a medusa or maybe a combination of both, both will generally produce a zygote, which again is that fertilized egg, that's going to develop into what we call a modal planula larvae. So this is going to be a type of larvae that's going to be able to move from place to place. Now, the purpose of this is to allow this larvae to settle maybe in a different part of the environment. Now, once it does settle, it's going to metamorphosize, and it's going to metamorphosize or change into a polyp body form. Now, this polyp could make other polyps, which again is a form of asexual reproduction, or it could actually produce free-swimming medusa, which is still considered an asexual type of reproduction because it's coming from the same animal. And it's typically going to do this by bedding, budding. Now the medusa will reproduce sexually, which means that we're going to have both male and female gametes being produced. Now what makes these cnidarians a little bit different from the sponges we had looked at a little bit earlier in chapter 12 is that um, cnidarians are considered dioecious, which means that you have separate male and female animals. So of course the males are going to produce the sperm, the females are going to produce the eggs. Now, because we have two different body forms, um, life cycles which contain both a polyp and a medusa body form can definitely take advantage of both open water and bottom environments when it comes down to their reproductive strategies. Now, as I had said at the beginning of the screencast, cnidarians are considered a diploblastic type of animal. So when you look at a cnidarian, these animals are actually made up of two tissue layers. And these two tissue layers are the outer epidermis and the inner gastrodermis. Now they're diploblastic because the outer epidermis comes from a primitive layer called the ectoderm. Now again, ecto is going to refer to the outside. And the inner gastrodermis is going to come from the endoderm. And the endo is the primitive layer that means inside. Now, if you're talking about the outer epidermis, as you can see over here on the right-hand side, this is kind of like the skin of the cnidarian. If you're talking about the inner gastrodermis, which is located right here, you're talking about an inner layer that's going to be used primarily for digestion. Now, it may contain various cell types, and we're going to look at those in lab, and that includes the cnidocytes that are going to help this animal to, to feed. Now, in between the outer epidermis and the inner gastrodermis, we have another layer called the mesoglea. And that's going to, as I said, lie between the epidermis and the gastrodermis, and it's going to be attached to both layers. Now, this is not considered a cellular layer. It's actually a gelatinous type of material. Um, in polyps, it's going to be found thickest at the very base of the animal, and it's going to be found thinnest in the tentacles. Now at the base, it needs to be really strong, it needs to be really thick so it can support the polyp. Now in the tentacles, it needs to be relatively thin so it can allow those tentacles to move from place to place. So it's going to allow flexibility in those tentacles. So it's going to simply act as an elastic skeleton. Elastic means the ability to move type of skeleton. It's very buoyant in the medusa and may actually contain amoeboid cells. Now thinking back to our very first screencast on um, this particular phylum of animals, remember we had talked about the word cnidaria being derived or taken from the cnidocytes that are found within this group of animals. And remember the cnidocytes are considered special stinging cells. And these cells allow the animal to be very effective 
predators. Because again, you have a group of animals here that don't move very fast. Um, whether it's a polyp or a medusa, they still move relatively slowly. Um, these cnidocytes are going to be found in the epidermis of the animal. So again, looking at this particular tissue layer right here, you're going to notice the cnidocyte is located right here. And the cnidocyte contains special cell parts or organelles called nidae. And we had said that there have been approximately 20 nidae that have been identified up to this point. Now these nidae or cell parts can be discharged. Now when they are discharged, it's kind of unique in the nidocytes because after they're discharged, they can actually be reabsorbed and actually replaced by the nidocyte. Now the type of nidae that we're going to look at in um, this particular chapter in this group of animals is the nematocyst. Now this nematocyst is represented down here. And you can see the nematocyst right here. Now this whole cell right here is called the nidocyte. Now remember, we have to make sure that we can distinguish between the nidocyte and the nematocyst. The nidocyte is the cell. The nematocyst is going to be the cell part within that cell. Now this nematocyst can be used to inject toxins into prey or it could also be used to defend the animal. So we have a cell part that is all coiled up here and if by chance something should touch this trigger on the outside of the nidocyte, then this particular nematocyst is going to be discharged. There's going to be special spines here that will help to hold onto um, the organism or the animal and there could be toxins contained within this nematocyst which would be injected into the animal. So again, these nidocytes are very unique to this particular group in helping both for um, obtaining prey and defending the animal. <coughs> Now when talking about cnidarians, it's important to understand that all members of cnidaria are considered carnivorous, which means they do eat other animals. Now they're going to catch their prey with their tentacles using those cnidocytes that are embedded within the epidermis of that tentacle. Now once they've trapped their prey, they're going to pass that prey onto the centrally located mouth. Then they're going to pass that prey onto the gastrovascular cavity for digestion. And remember, gastro refers to digestion. Now, in the diagram on the right hand side, you can see the gastrovascular cavity located right here. Now, there's two different types of digestion that will occur in cnidarians. We have extracellular digestion and intracellular digestion. If it's extracellular, extra means on the outside. And this is going to be started when the gland cells located right here within this gastrodermis are going to secrete um, special enzymes to begin the process. So this is kind of similar to, um, to how we digest food. If you think about food as we take it into our mouth, we have special enzymes in our saliva that start to break the food down. Then as we swallow the food down into our stomach, we have special enzymes and acids that again help to um, continue to break that food down. Now these animals also have intracellular digestion. Intra means inside. So once the food has gotten to the size where it can actually be taken in by other cells, it's going to um, continue to digest this food within the gastrodermis of the animal. So again, the gastrodermis is right here. So these cells right through here are going to participate in digestion. Now if you notice down towards the bottom it says a few species of corals will supplement their nutrition by collecting carbon from their algal symbionts, which means it's a symbiotic type of relationship. So to finish up screencast number two, we're going to look a little bit at the nervous system of these animals. Now this is important because when we talked about sponges, we really didn't see any type of organized nervous system. But when you talk about this next phyla, the cnidarians, you actually do have a somewhat organized um, nervous system. They have what we call nerve nets, and they have two of those. One's going to be found at the base of the epidermis, which you can see located right here, and then we also have one that's going to be found at the base of the gastrodermis. Now there is not a local concentration of nerve cells to indicate any type of central nervous system. Now what we mean by that simply is that these animals really don't have a brain. Um, for us, for example, we have a brain, we have our spinal column, which represents our central nervous system. These animals aren't quite organized that way. But the nerve net can process and respond to stimuli in much the same way that our brain would respond to the stimuli that we would sense in our environment. Now some do have marginal sense organs. Um, the ropalia that you see right down here 
These are going to be special structures which are going to house what we call chemoreceptors. The prefix chemo basically means that these animals can pick up various chemicals within their environment. They also have statuses which are going to allow these animals to maintain balance in their environment and they might also have ocelli which would be very simple light receptors in these animals. So that's going to finish up our second and final screencast for chapter 13. Um, again, as always, please make sure that you fill out the study guide that goes along with this screencast.